Hello. Thank you so much to the Feminist Kings podcast. That was really gorgeous. I One of the things I love about PAL is amplifying younger people's voices and making sure that this is always a really intergenerational conversation because we've got so much to learn from people in like all different stages of life. So that was truly gorgeous. Um, we have got another really exciting podcasty thing coming up soon. Uh, the next one is going to be live, which will be fun. But bear in mind, because it's live, it means there might be some swearing. So um, if you have little ones near you, or if you have very delicate ears yourself, then it is worth knowing that. Uh, just before we dive into that, I've got a couple more of these like rest cards. And I was looking through them and just wanted to share a few because they are really beautiful, really, really beautiful, but quite like, I found some of them quite confronting in a way. So the first one I've pulled out is I will unravel from urgency. And I think that's a really hard thing to do when the world around you ends up demanding urgency of you. And so to kind of convince yourself that that's something you don't need to, if there's a call for urgency that you don't always need to answer it or answer it in a, a specific kind of way. I think that's really essential. So I'm taking that one with me big time. Don't worry, I'm not stealing the card. I'm just gonna take this in my brain. Um, let's have another one. I do nothing alone. My whole life is a collaboration. And I think that is so juicy and important to not feel like we're isolated. I think independence is crucial and a really lovely thing to kind of cultivate in our lives but to never assume that we are alone in that and to, to cultivate that community building just as much as our self resilience. So yeah, I, oh, and final, final speedy one, which is quick, but made me go, oh my God, I feel this a lot. I am not lazy. I need to say that to myself like every day when I'm having a hard time and, and not doing much because our, our days are not to be filled all the time constantly and laziness is something that can we can really like punish ourselves around when I don't think that's actually what we're doing rest is not laziness um, right I'm going to uh, introduce you into the wonderful world of Sarah Fox's podcast which is called do good and do well um, they're going to be talking about how we can rest and like how essential that is but also how difficult that is so i can't wait to listen hello sarah hi hello. everybody else have a gorgeous <laughs> recording um and i will see you all after after the recording Mwah. thank you ruby can everyone hear me okay checking in yeah. <laughs> um thank you ruby yeah it's i've really enjoyed um the conversations that have happened this morning and all the yoga and loveliness it's been it's been really brilliant um and welcome everybody to this very special episode of do good and do well um my name is sarah fox i live in ramsgate i've lived here for 20 years now which makes me feel super old um and i help people to increase their positive social impact in the world uh, and look after themselves in the process. So uh, I do that in all kinds of ways, but mostly in my capacity as a coach. Um, I will introduce the podcast in a second and my wonderful guests who you can see on the screen. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to invite you, if you are on YouTube or Facebook, um, come and say hello. It would be really nice to know who is watching and listening. Uh, say hello to us, let us know where you are in the world. And if at any point during uh, this recording, um, you have any questions, any reflections, any ideas, then please do put those in the chat. Um, we are in no way, and I'm sure everyone will agree with this, we are in no way experts on this idea of rest when we're trying to do good in the world. And we know that there are lots of thoughts out there, so we would love to hear them. Um, so Do Good and Do Well is a podcast for people who really want to change the world for the better. Um, they care about community and social justice. They care about equity and being kind and compassionate towards others. Um, they have a strong sense of purpose and connection. 
and they don't want to break themselves in the process. Um, and we wanted to record this as part of the Power Festival because I'm really curious about where rest lies in this desire to do good. Um, you know, if you want a business that's for good, um, if you're an activist, if you're a carer, if you're a nurse, if you're a teacher, whatever it is, if you're wanting to do good for other people, how, how do you do that? And actually, how do we rest when there is so much good to be done in the world? And, it, you know, we only need to take a minute to think about what is going on in the world. It feels like it's literally and metaphorically burning at the moment. People being taken hostage, women, girls, families being murdered in Palestine, you know, is it okay for me to rest when all of that stuff is happening? Is it okay that I rest when people like Diane Abbott are being subjected to horrific racial abuse? You know, when there are thousands and thousands of homeless people on the street, is it okay for me to rest? You know, it feels like there's so much to be done. I don't think we're going to answer that question by the end of this episode, <laughs> but we're going to give it a good go. Um, and I'm so thankful to be joined today by three wonderful women who I am extraordinarily proud to be connected to. I'm going to invite them to introduce themselves so you can stop listening to me. So my question to you all is please introduce yourself, tell us about yourself, where you are and I'd love to know for you what are you curious about when it comes to this subject matter of rest? Rosie, Rosie Wilby, can we start with you? Oh, yes. Thank you very much, Sarah Fox. <laughs> We're doing kind of formal, full names. <laughs> uh, so um, it's been lovely to get to know you and appear on your podcast. And I suppose the reason that I've ended up appearing on that podcast is because through my work as a comedian and a performer and storyteller and author, I have been on a bit of a quest to spread a message of thinking about our relationships, our human relationships, our romantic relationships, sexual relationships and friendships in sort of compassionate ways and thinking about how we can still be kind to one another in an era of dating apps and Tinder and all these kind of weird and wonderful ways we meet and connect and, and hook up now. And I've sort of been unofficially named the queen of breakups thanks to my book, uh, The Breakup Monologues, which we have spoken about on the podcast in depth. And I think I'm really interested in how we can recover after breakups, after difficult events, after a friendship ending or some form of loss and how that rest is really important in our recovery. And actually it's during those periods of self-care and rest that actually we're becoming stronger and we're sort of harnessing that bad experience and sort of transforming it and using it as a sort of fuel for for a new chapter for a good new start for change mm, lovely thank you rosie yeah we um uh, we'll get on to this in a sec, but we've we've been emailing each other um, in the last sort of week or so, um, and there is just so so much to think about when it comes to rest and all of our work, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Bernadette, who are Ooh. you? Tell us about <laughs> what matters to you when it comes to rest. Hello. Um, yes, my name's Bernadette Russell. I am I ca my background sort of theatre and cabaret. And then I travelled from there to um, become an, an author and a kindness campaigner, which is a big sort of story behind that, um, and also a, a, a tree planter and a storyteller in the broadest sense of that. And I'm I'm really interested in um, the subject of rest because I'm trying I'm considering and working myself on how we can manage to be restful. When we just are in, when we're in, rather than waiting for an idyllic period in the future, when everything will be, <clears throat> you know, there'll be a regular uh, timetable as a freelancer, there'll be normal working hours, whatever that is. Where we, whether we can, when we are super busy and we have deadlines, which I have quite a lot, whether we, where, how we can so rest into those times, rather than waiting for a mythical time in the future, when everything will be nice and tidy. And we've got like staff 
which I don't have. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm interested in that. I think it's really important. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Annette. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I describe myself as a clarity and leadership coach, which is a job title I kind of made up. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? But I'm a big fan of making up job titles, so I kind of feel okay with it. And it seems to fit with what I do. Um, the way I describe my work is I help weary women in the performing arts to reignite the fire in their belly so they can lead with confidence, compassion and calm. And I, I kind of believe all three of those things should be possible, even if they don't feel like it. Um, I used to be a legal PA a long time ago, 16 years ago, actually almost to the month. And what I saw is people working like silly hours, but they were also making silly money. And then I kind of moved into the sector of the arts where I was still watching people work for like three hours. Money <laughs> was maybe not, mm. you know, not quite so there. And I was just surrounded by these amazing women who went above and beyond to create really important work and really impactful work. And I was also watching this kind of burning out, getting really overwhelmed, being, I love how much word compassion has come up already today they're being really compassionate to everyone around them but not very compassionate to themselves so a lot of my work is around how can you kind of tune back into yourself and listen to what you do what you want and what you love instead of always telling the stories of other people actually which is another mm -hmm. that's already coming through uh so now my focus is entirely on coaching and facilitation uh still broadly in the creative sector um this whole topic really speaks to me because I think there's something around a conversation that you and I have had a lot actually Sarah about this idea of how can we create these systems where we're moving away from this idea of like constant growth and productivity and recognizing the importance of spaces to just rest and reflect and what how do we need to shift the models for that to be possible mm. yeah thank you I think what you've all touched upon there is something for me about how do we reimagine? How do we reimagine what all of this stuff could look like? So that rest isn't a, a privilege, an add-on, or you know, a, a thing that we might get to at some point when I've finished my to-do list, <laughs> I'll be able to rest. Like what what at, you know, there are so many um systems and structures that need to be dismantled and reimagined so you know we'll give it a go see if we can start today on this podcast um so i'm thinking about uh a sort of where rest shows up in the work that you do and you've all you've all touched upon that um already um but i'd love to know you know that this idea of rest or even not resting you know what are you noticing in the in the work that you're doing in the context of your of your work so if we start with bernadette you know i often i often say in my coaching coaching that like humans are social beings like we you know we tell stories we listen to stories we we kind of need that connection with others storytelling is firmly in our dna i think mm. um and I wonder with your work, like, do you notice any patterns or themes coming up in that idea of storytelling around this idea of, you know, how do you take rest in the face of adversity or, or changing the world? Um, yeah, I thought that was such a good question, Sarah, when, I, when you messaged me with it earlier. It made me laugh because I was considering all kinds of stories uh, you know, classical myths, personal stories, epic, uh, you know, Marvel type stories. And I was thinking, yeah, they're not really about rest, are they? <laughs> or if someone's resting, if something dramatic happens, someone kicks the door down and have to get on with it. So I was considering that and I thought, actually, what the, the, the many ways that you can tell and share stories, which is sort of infinite and there are many different ways of describing yourself as a storyteller, what it actually invites is an opportunity to they they do um, invite an opportunity to rest because whilst you're listening to somebody or watching or considering a story you can just enjoy it i think that's really valid mm -hmm. just as entertainment or you can be invited to or invite yourself to reflect what would i do if i faced a dragon 
what would I do if the witch in the wood gave me seven challenges to do what you know any anything so I think um stories invite you to do that um, and they can do it uh, very metaphorically in a fantastical way or very naturalistic way naturalistically but I also think storytelling can te teach us um, how to listen to ourselves which is a kind of form of rest just listen to yourself mm. what's the story you're telling yourself and we and also invites us to learn active listening so we're really listening to other people um but yeah mostly i was thinking it's interesting isn't it how the stories that really thrill us and exciting and are prevalent are very action driven they don't really involve long passages of people <laughs> like getting pedicles no. but you know <laughs> Yeah. Rosie, I think we should see to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, although, yeah. Interesting, in a lot of classical folklore and sort of classical mythology, I was thinking what there are a sort of journey. So people are journeying, they're going, for, they are really long journeys, which can exactly be described as a rest, but could be described as reflective time. Mm. And another thing I just wanted to mention is I'm really at the, in the thick of this is the consideration of um, the heroine's journey versus the hero's journey as expanded by Joseph Campbell what wonderful Joseph Campbell but it was obviously perhaps obviously a very sort of male perspective of what journeying through life means and considering as um, women our journey in that in, in that sort of heroine's journey framework and where and allowing ourselves in our story periods when we don't do anything when we just rest when we do sit up and have a pedicure and the value of that I think Mm. yes yes there's just so much in what you said the thing that um i just thought my family really loved the marvel movies and i was yes. just thinking you know how dull would it be <laughs> if suddenly everyone was like we're not gonna save the world we're gonna do a podcast about you know what it is to rest when we're kind of up against these evil um but yeah i think that that that's an interesting point as well about what rest for that I don't know if you can hear my dog she's snoring <laughs> <laughs> um, Perfect. Him, sorry. resting resting dog um well, I've totally lost my point now but yes that kind of uh hero heroine the, the difference that's that's coming up there and the fact that there aren't stories about rest you know yeah. that that that, that there seems to be less of a theme about that and so actually that's quite a big signifier of, of how we as a society think about it in the first place mm. or just to say Sarah it is presented as kind of evil so you often get baddies <laughs> who make other people do work for them okay. so they can rest they have the staff <laughs> like Baba Yaga you know there's lots of instances of wicked women or, or wicked or wicked folk making other people sweep up the the embers or whatever it is yeah mm. so the well, rest of the hand players in coffins and things <laughs> yeah oh my goodness that is a whole other podcast okay <laughs> um, so um annette your work with kind of weary women leaders i i love that phrase well i don't love it but i love it uh you know particularly in the art sector that's definitely my bag as well um having kind of lived in the art sector and the not-for-profit sector for a very long time um and seeing people who really care about what they do they're really passionate they love it and in a way that connection to purpose is a form of rest you know we can think of it as that as well but I'm just wondering like what what are you noticing in your work about mm. rest well it's funny that weary word literally I've only come up with it this year <laughs> so it's very new because I was trying to find the word that kind of sums it up and I tested it at a conference in January and every time I said to someone who was a woman in the arts and used the word weary they were like oh oh god yeah that's me you can see like this physical reaction and <laughs> uh, and I think it's entirely what you say it's that connection with purpose where people just all their energy is kind of expended outwards because they really believe in what they do and they kind of forget to reserve any for themselves and there's this sense that I because I'm passionate about about what I do I'm going to make sure that everyone else is looked after and yeah there's something about oh God, I feel like I'm so influenced by what you guys have said already that I'm going to go <laughs> 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 so 
<laughs> so I was just saying, I actually use the heroine's journey in my coaching as well as a framework. And there's something in there about, um, there's a part in there about the refusal of the call. I think there's this layer of expectation on women in particular to do the work for everyone. And yeah, this sense of laziness being terrible, the word selfish being, oh my God, we can't ever be selfish. We have to be looking after everyone else all the time. Mm -hmm. And what I notice is there's this kind of like perfect storm of people who have a passion for what they do. And also with my clients, I tend to see this kind of, I call it the three Ps of people pleasing, perfectionism and plate spinning. <laughs> Like, oh, yes. like everyone at once, literally it's like we're doing everything for everyone else all the time and how that impacts on their ability to do the work they want to do anyway so it's like it's it's kind of counterintuitive if they don't rest they're not going to be able to do what they want to do mm. it's making me think i i coach um I coach a lot of leaders, particularly head teachers. And one of the things we've talked about a lot, especially since the pandemic, is this, how do we, how do, or, or what responsibility should we take for other people's well-being? And um, I sometimes think of it as um, a bit like health and safety. You know, if you do health and safety training and they say everyone in the room is responsible for health and safety, like if you see a bag in a corridor, don't wait for someone else to pick it up, pick it up because we're all responsible. And I feel a bit like that with well-being as well, that we we need to take personal responsibility of our of our own well-being as much as we can, given given some of the things that are happening, the systems and um and support others but we can't take it as leaders you can't take all of that responsibility for how other people are feeling how other people are looking after themselves because as you say ultimately when do you then rest when do you as a leader take a rest um yeah it's really you know i th what you were saying there's so many i, I totally uh, resonates with me I work with a lot of people who sort of producers as well and that's I think that job title is basically like professional people please yeah. <laughs> basically you have to look after everyone yeah yeah it's quite liberating when you realize you don't have to be a people pleaser as a, as someone a recover I call myself a recovering people pleaser <laughs> I still you know at times take on that you know walk into a room and think gosh how is everyone else feeling and I need you know and I want to kind of support that and make sure everyone's okay but I do notice it notice it more um thank you Annette Rosie what about what about you rest in your work well yeah, I've been thinking a lot about the cyclical nature of rest because being a comedian and performer and writer who speaks about relationships, I think a lot about the cycles of a relationship when we go from, you know, the first blossoming of attraction and love through the sort of ups and downs of the middle stages of a relationship to the the heartbreak and loss of of the ending of a relationship and then the sort of cycles different stages of grief we might go through when something has ended and then we go into a new beginning and and sort of embark on the roller coaster again and so to think about these sort of cycles a little bit my book I wrote the first half in a sort of backwards timeline and the second half in a forwards timeline to get this idea of the end of something always being the beginning of something new in this constant journey we're on and the fact that you know these these sort of lower moments when when there's less happening in the story there's it's not the big fight scene in the in the drama in the film um you know or the big love scene or the big Thing, the big climax you know these these moments are when important things are happening and are being nurtured in ourselves and I think the sort of cycles of creativity work very much in in similar ways um I used to do Edinburgh Fringe as a comedian every year and so everything would be geared around this ridiculously intense month during August when you're performing every day and you would have had sort of previews and months of writing leading up to that and then you'd just would have, have to sort of crash in September. It was like Comedian's New Year when everyone was run down and had the flu. Um, <laughs> and I, I just think we, we have to allow ourselves those periods of rest. My wife is actually 
a physical, a strength and conditioning coach for young tennis players. And she always says those those moments of rest, both those sort of very brief moments after you've been lifting weights or doing something, but then the sort of longer periods of rest after you've done a training session, um, those are when the muscles are actually getting stronger. So that's a sort of very clear example of how we are growing and learning and developing in the ways that we need to when we rest from doing that activity. So when I'm writing, it's the probably the moments when I'm out walking the dog or I, I go and have a walk on the beach or I go and swim in the sea in Margate um, mm. when actually more creativity is happening than when I'm sitting at the laptop screen sort of bashing out the things, the thoughts that I've had when I've been wandering and my mind has been a bit freer. Mm yeah definite that's the shower for me like just standing in the shower that's when yeah. I have all my best ideas I'm like oh how am I I'm not never going to remember this <laughs> um and also it reminds me it, I I every week go to a spin class which at the time is is absolutely horrific um and I'm just trying to think <laughs> of like how I'm going to survive um but there are it, it's a kind of half an hour class and the instructor will say there isn't much rest, but when there is rest, you really need to take it because the rest is as important as the work. Um, and I think of that throughout my whole week. The rest is as important as the work. Um, it, it's so, so, um, yeah, it's a, I, I find it a really useful thing to remember. Um, I don't think we need permission to rest. I think, you know, and, and we don't need to earn rest, but there is something about giving ourselves that permission and, and a kind of affirmation like that can be or an affirmation uh, a kind of sentence like that can be helpful um mm. does anyone we've got like a minute before we move on to the next section because i'm really keeping an eye also on just on the sorry on the cyclical nature oh. of rest i also think we've got to touch on just the fact that as women we become <clears throat> very accustomed to the idea of a cycle of feeling yeah. very active and and very capable and together and focused and like a superhuman at certain times of the month and then at other times of the month really not and that's whether mm -hmm. you're still having periods every few weeks or whether you've moved into sort of perimenopause and menopause and that that is sort of less regular or, or is not happening there is still a, a sense of these ebbs and flows I mean I'm on HRT now so that is a whole <laughs> whirlwind of, of stuff and um yeah when I when I get to the 10 11 days when I'm taking progesterone I am way more tired and need way more rest mm -hmm. yeah totally <laughs> I have a oh sorry Ben don't go on no, I was just gonna say yeah I, I I really agree with that with what Rosie said and there's also this sort of why because i plant trees a lot and have done for many years so I think there's a whole and um, probably you've all had it when you've been out walking your dogs or wandering along the beach but there's also that really deep realization that the, the apple tree isn't in blossom all of the year mm. you know it's in blossom some of the year and that fallow period winter time is really important but also I was thinking about trees in relation to this and I was thinking although they are they do have periods when there's no leaves and they look like they're resting and they're fallow. They're actually really busy, a little bit like you in your shower, Sarah, and you in your swimming room. It's like the stuff still happens. It's just that, that there's time to let go of the leaves, just chill out. Um, yeah, so I think nature mm. sort of shows us that as well. There's a time, you know, nothing, nothing blossoms all year round or not very many things blossom all year round. Mm. Yeah. So to let go of that, the leaves nourishing the roots kind of sense of that before it all mm. comes back out awesome. yeah mm. so we know all this logically it's like <laughs> we know, <laughs> we know it we can intellectualize it we can talk about it um but i'm wondering about how we how we really internalize it or how how we um uh integrate this this into our work um and I, I want to just move on to this idea of doing good and rest you know if we if we uh, I heard on the ADHD um and rest panel earlier I think it was Rebecca Rebecca Douglas talking um about <laughs> this is perimenopause it's just totally gone out of my head could you tell that the <laughs> thought was just like wandering um no, it's, it's it's gone. It's gone. Anyway, um, 
it will come back it will come back yeah this idea that you when you when you're at the forefront of something when you really care about something and you're trying to influence and change and address you know it can, can be on this sort of global sense social injustice and and what's happening or it can be very micro and and community and you're you know looking after your neighbor or even your family um where when can we when can we rest when we're trying to do that work and I often I mean I think someone's already mentioned that idea of if we rest then we might be seen as lazy um I often work with people who are uh, you know they're high achievers they feel safe when they're constantly doing stuff that makes them feel safe in the world achieving things getting the next academic qualification and then the next and doing the next course and the next course um, and it's kind of sometimes it feels a bit like a, a lie that we have to keep going and going and going because if we don't keep going what you know what what will happen and uh, you know if I think about my own life I grew up working class from a working class background um my dad was disabled often felt very or not he didn't feel excluded he was excluded you know I had this really strong sense from a very early age about wanting to help people uh, know that they are that they belong um and so it's really personal for me you know this stuff of helping people to live a life that feels good but also support feels good for themselves but also supports everyone else you know what's going on in the world is important it drives me um and there's no i suppose there's no um it's not a coincidence that i ended up working for a housing association and then an arts charity which was working on those kind of dodgy estates of what pe you know people would call where i live that dodgy estate that disadvantage i ended up working on those for 15 years a real sense of this of this drive um when you are someone who gives a shit <laughs> about <laughs> others is it possible is it possible to rest tell me what do you what what do you think annette can we start with you oh god i don't know sarah <laughs> 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 um and, and i'm probably the worst person to speak in this in this week, because I've got a cold, because I pushed myself too hard through the beginning of March, and I'm like, I'm dosed up with paracetamol to keep me awake. Um, I think, oh wow, uh, I've made the most, <laughs> I've made the most important decisions in my life when I've been forced to stop. But I'm not sure that answers the question. <laughs> where, um, like, actually, when I was a legal PA, I broke my wrist. I had to take six weeks off, and that's when I realised I didn't give a shit about being a legal PA. <laughs> Um, and when we do, it is very difficult. We talked about permission. You have to give yourself permission to stop. Feels almost as if you're kind of neglecting the mission that you believe in. It feels like you're letting people down. Mm. And... So, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> that, that was um, my dog uh, suddenly jumped down off the stool and she knocked her bone onto the floor because <laughs> oh. she heard what Annette said and she was yeah, like she I don't know either <laughs> I think I've forgotten the question now <laughs> is, that a, quite, is the question of, attention <laughs> <laughs> is it is it possible to rest when we are so truly connected to mm -hmm. wanting to do something good and that we're, you know, I think often the people that I work with, they're also very, um, they're aware of really investigating that sense of what is good as well, you know, because I think we we can we can think something is good, but doesn't mean that it is. In fact, it can do more harm than good. So there's like a there's a, there's, a, there's a whole load of stuff that I think comes when you are someone who is driven to, you know, that you want to leave the world in a better place than you arrived. And the question is, you know, is it in your in your experiences as helpers, as change makers, as a as a business who, you know, wants to make a difference? Is it possible to rest when there's so much to be done? I think there's sort of um sorry, Annette, did I interrupt you? No, I'll come back. Are you sure? Yes, I think I'm processing. 
<laughs> I, I just saw a couple of things in relation to your broken wrist actually mm. and being forced to rest because i i um i got long i i did break and i got long covid as a result of having covid twice very quickly and and then and, and on the back of sort of 10 years of working 80 hours a week and i'm not exaggerating so mm. um what happened then and i'm very much in the, the the recovery end of that though i did have it for two years so what happened when i was like one was i was like oh i i just can't i have to sleep longer i have to rest now and then i was thinking and it's funny isn't it like if i said to you sarah i can't speak to you for a bit because i'm doing transcendental meditation you wouldn't say to me oh that's so lazy that transcendental meditation <laughs> but if I just said to you I'm just sitting down I'm gonna have a cup of tea you know I so some of it was about fooling myself I had to say look rest is part of the work and actually using those words to separate it for me wasn't that useful in the way that for me separating life and work as words isn't that useful it's all work or it's all life and the rest is part of the work was how I recovered from being so ill. you know I had to really adjust to being incredibly energetic to being not really being able to move very much and thankfully I'm a lot better now but I only got better by by resting and sewing that properly into my day and seeing it as part of part of the work and it is because as I think everybody said when I'm walking around in the woods or when I'm by the river resting or having some time off that's when uh i get ideas or mm. i find solutions so i start thinking actually i don't think it's that separate really i don't think life and work's that separate mm. that's not useful for me i don't think rest and work is that separate it's all part of my practice so i persuaded myself and i had to to be honest i'm not particularly proud mm. of that but i had to by thinking rest is part of my practice and i have to model that behavior because I have to, sh and, I, and I've included it in story, in when I'm telling stories or encouraging people to tell their stories, it's like your holidays stories are great stories. Your jumping in puddles encourages other people to, gives people permission to jump in puddles. So if we model that, and, and when I get advice or um, I'm working with somebody, I, I do pay attention to if they seem to be the sort of person that give, makes sure they have a chance to have fun and it makes mm. me feel a little bit easier. Yeah. Mm. I hope that made sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, so that fun piece, I think that is, is a form of rest, I think, especially when the work that you can be doing is so intense and, um, you know, impactful. It's, you know, as a, so as a coach, and I'm, you know, Annette, you're probably the same. Like, I, I need to make sure that I'm able to hold a space for my mm -hmm. clients. And that means that I, you know, ideally need to be rested, but also that I have things like supervision where I can go and talk about some of the things that are happening in, in those spaces to, to kind of let go. That for me is a form of rest to be able to, to let go of the, some of, some of the stuff that I might be um, holding. Um, Rosie, Annette, anything else to add on, on that? Is it possible? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, um, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about Bernadette's experience of long COVID. I, I had COVID a couple of times and it, it was awful. Mm. Although the sort of, if you like, kind of weirdly positive side of the pandemic for me was it did force me to reassess mm. my schedules, my working day and how I worked because previously to that I had juggled so many different things as a comedian gigging around the world all the time and um, performing and writing talks and shows and articles and working as a freelance journalist and writing books and doing so many different things and constantly juggling them whereas obviously during the first lockdown I was writing the breakup monologues and all my events were cancelled, which was devastating at first um, and really scary. But actually it made me just focus on one thing. And I mean, I'm, I'm grateful that I had that thing. I, I had been asked by a publisher to write a book. So I was fortunate in that sense that I'd, I had a small advance. and I had a little bit of money coming in and not quite that terrible fear that many people had that 
you know, particularly freelancers who weren't protected by some of the same things that that employed people were. I, I didn't have some of those same fears, but I did sort of realize how much I loved writing outdoors and, and having that freedom to sort of, you know, take the dog out into the park and, and let ideas flourish and flow. And it was a very different kind of day and routine for me. And I wish in many ways that we had all learned more from those times mm -hmm. and held on to some of that lockdown spirit, even though obviously it was for terrible reasons that our lives were so transformed for that period of time in, in, in 2020. But I do think there were some positive lessons we could have taken, but it feels like in many ways we've just allowed Zoom and all these platforms we have now to be able to communicate and, and sort of be in each other's lives constantly 24 seven, we've sort of allowed the technology to make us even busier in a way, because we're always on a Zoom or a FaceTime or we're always on a phone call or, a you know, Skyping or whatever it is, you know, always on social media. And, and we seem to have escalated even more as a reaction to the pandemic, whereas I feel like we could have held on to some of those, the good parts of that terrible time in the world and how we were all baking banana bread. Um, yeah. And it sort of became a bit of a joke, but actually... I really enjoyed baking banana bread. It, it was great. It was quite comforting at that sort of very strange time in my life. And and I also think, Sarah, I, I know what you're saying about how it feels hard to let go of that that sort of mission that, that you have all the time. For me, it's really been about representation of the LGBTQ community and writing inclusively about relationships. And, you know, all the time I read books about relationships that, are sort of written from such a heteronormative point of view with sweeping disclaimers at, at the beginning of them about how, you know, I'm talking about relationships between a man and a woman, but we'll assume all those other relationships work just the same. <laughs> um, and so all the time I get frustrated and I get annoyed by that and I, I don't feel seen and I know that all my friends, all my community, all the people who've supported my shows over the years so many of them don't feel seen and don't feel represented as well and it's hard to sort of let go of that frustration and you know, not not want to keep always doing things you know I, I do tons of um you know shows for free for for brilliant lgbt charities and so on and you know i have to sort of balance that carefully but it, it is tough isn't it when you have mm. a mission that you feel so passionately about how do you give yourself that permission but you, but you have to or else <laughs> You know, you well, are going to burn out and not be effective at doing the thing that you need to do. And you have to also, so it allows other people to. Mm. Yeah. You know, you, you, I think you can, you can, we can persuade ourselves by thinking, well, it's modelling sort of good practice, isn't it? Yeah. I think yeah. the pandemic was a really interesting kind of inflection point. And as, as particularly for my clients, they were, they were already weary. But now it's like weary with a capital dump. There's <laughs> <laughs> this sense that there was all this talk about, oh, okay, we, we, we recognize the system's not working. We need to change something. And there was a lot said about it. And then we've come back and we've, as you say, we've kind of slipped back into old habits. And Zoom has become this kind of ever present way of meeting where we don't necessarily have spaces between meetings as well. We don't have that mm. natural downtime of walking from one meeting room to another or getting a cup of tea, having a, like, yeah, a random. Driving, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's yeah. that's part of my where kind of weariness has come come back. Mm. And I want to talk as well like this the creativity at rest that Bernadette picks up on. It's like my I'm most creative when I go for a walk. I, I moved down to the south coast last May. I live near Hastings. And my like morning and evening commute because I work from home is I go for a walk by the sea. Mm. And there are so many of my social media posts are me with my like my phone up to my face with my hat on because that's where the idea has come <laughs> it's yeah. Kind of, yeah it's that different kind of rest mm, it is yeah we're, we're, we're going to come on to kind of ways to rest in in a second but we've had a couple of questions um which is very exciting and we'd love yes. more um okay the first one this is a biggie okay are you ready how can we overthrow the cultural norm that equates 
busyness with success. So we had a bit of a conversation about this in email, didn't we, about that, you know, the the glamour of busyness. And but actually, I think this is about, you know, when people look at you and they see you're busy, particularly on social media, I think, you know, if you're posting and people people say to me like, wow, business looks like it's going really great because of what they're seeing on, on Instagram. And it kind of is sometimes and it kind of isn't and other times. And so, yeah, any thoughts on this idea of how we overthrow that cultural norm? It's so interesting because I, I often think if someone's got so much time to post on social media that maybe – they haven't got a lot of stuff going on. Actually, when I'm doing the really exciting and interesting creative work, like um, I made myself write a novel, um, and I've never written a novel. I've always written nonfiction. But I made myself write a novel um, from through September, from September through to the end of January, because I entered a competition, and I've been. Um, I've got through to the next stage of that competition and so that that was really exciting and I I used that as a as a bit of an incentive to do it but because I had a short timeline to write a full book um I I really wasn't doing much social media and I felt very invisible I felt very insecure I felt anxious I I could when I did quickly look on it and maybe post something a little quick story or something um, I, I felt like all my friends, all my fellow comedians and peers were, were doing so much stuff. But I thought, but I'm doing something really great that I'm going to be able to, I hope, shout about in the future. And it's something I can actually feel way more proud of myself, I guess, if that sounds okay to say. Because <laughs> you are allowed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not proud of myself. I do the thing, um, <laughs> but if I feel that's more of an achievement than sort of, you know, keeping on posting on Instagram every day. Yeah, I had a couple of months where I really didn't do any Instagram posts, and I still, I still look at my feed and go, oh, there's a, there was a real gap, wasn't there? And, but <laughs> it's fine, you know. But it's it's it is. hard, isn't it? Because I think it, I think social media is is a big part of why we we really have pornified um busyness busy lives mm. it's worth asking ourselves i think um often what we're using social media for which can change because sometimes it's just to like have a nice chat sometimes it's to uh, you feel obliged to or you want to kind of share what you're doing or tell your particular story and and that feels like it's like it's changed recently to me that feels like it's sort of changed and also it kind of is a marketing tool so I think if you're freelancing you're running a small business there isn't really much option there but it does encourage the cult of busyness and I've certainly had I've literally put I'm not I'm not really doing anything and people have sent me messages saying they're really worried about me I'm like no I, I'm <laughs> I'm fine. I'm sort of <laughs> taking the dog to Greenwich. <laughs> it's um yeah, so I think it's to do with um I think it's to do with constantly feeling like we have to be productive. Mm -hmm. What I said yeah. earlier about saying if I say I'm doing transcendental meditation, that's allowed, isn't it? Because that's doing a thing. But if I said oh, I'm just walking around Lewisham, <laughs> that's not <laughs> that's not the same. Um so I think I think we have to take responsibility for itself. I'm not saying that it's our entire responsibility, but I think you have to sort of think in terms of social media, you think, what am I using it for? Why am I using it? And how is it affecting me? Um, and also don't feel that you have to tell the story that you're busy all the time. Mm -hmm. Let's have the courage to tell a different story. Mm -hmm. Um of ourselves and, and and about each other and not not tell that story because that's the only way it's going to change really mm. yeah i think it comes back to some modeling behavior doesn't it what we were talking about it's like i i now run my own business mm. if i'm going to be my own boss i don't want to be a shitty boss i want to give myself <laughs> like decent hours and time off <laughs> yes. yes and a pay rise <laughs> every <laughs> every six weeks <laughs> <laughs> I've got to tell you, all, I, I invented a boss because I haven't got, it's just me as it is, I know with all this. So I invented this boss called Mrs. Mingle. Mrs. Mingle is me, but, but I shouldn't have told you that because she thinks she's real. 
and and Mrs Mingle's quite she's quite strict but she does make sure that I have proper breaks so so the answer to the question about how we overthrow is that we need Mrs Mingle yeah Mrs. you do Mingle well, yeah Mrs Mingle <laughs> but that is, it is it's always with these questions isn't it there are big systemic issues you know how we overthrow is probably reimagining the entire world and yes. moving away from the capitalist society yes. exactly yeah capitalism is a big thing isn't it um just picking up on mrs mingle i realized that <laughs> when i was a musician and i was touring with another artist we invented ali who was our tour manager and the problem was that Ali was so lovely and kind and generous and it sort of gave everyone, you know, nice sort of, yes, time off or whatever, that people who were working with us wanted to work with Ali and they wanted <laughs> to meet her. And so we were wondering how we would sort of appear in different hats or disguises to actually be Ali, this kind of fictional it's a wonderful person. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, I'm going to I'm going to move us on a little bit because we've we've got a couple more questions, and you know, let we okay. Next podcast: fictional characters in our mind, <laughs> invisible friends mm. help us yes. rest. Um, so. Oh, I think one of the sessions after this recording, our, our podcast today, is that Everyday Racism is sharing, very generously sharing the talk that they did with Trisha Hersey, which I watched and is really great. So I would totally recommend staying around for that. Um, it's, it was amazing. Um, and and she, you know, I've got her book here, actually. Rest is Resistance. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and I just wanted to share a sentence that I highlighted and did all sorts of things. I use it quite a lot. But she said, uh, or says, rest is radical because it disrupts the lie that we are not doing enough. It shouts, no, that is a lie. I am enough. I am worthy now and always because I am here. Um, and I suppose to finish off the, the mm -hmm. podcast, um, and I will, I, I know we have got a couple of questions. I'd love for you to, to share what rest looks like for you we've kind of picked up on it already but uh th there's a researcher called sandra dalton smith and she talks about seven different ways of resting because i think we can often feel like rest is napping or sleeping and that can be quite doesn't always work it can be quite difficult um so she talks about mental rest and emotional rest and um social rest so i know that i am often in this room staring at a screen uh, with clients or not and, and sometimes I need to be face to face with people and have a cup of coffee to me that's a social form of rest seeing people in real life um, and or it can be the opposite sometimes I've I feel like I've <laughs> overstimulated on people my you know clients my family my children um, and I need to, I need disconnection. Um, so so given given this idea of rest as resistance, given the the um, you know thinking about what we've talked to, talked about today, what what does rest look like for you? And if you could kind of keep it fairly succinct, because I want to get to the questions as well. Um, Annette, do you want to go first? Mm. For me, it's so dependent on what kind of rest I need, which is kind of like an you know, answer, but it's, I think rest in sort of formal way of like meditation or yoga, or you know, those things that we sort of automatically reach for. Sometimes that can feel like a chore. Sometimes it needs to be something completely different. I love a dance break. If I've got like three minutes, mm, between yeah. me, I'll have a dance around my home office or we were talking about- demonstrate? Like, <laughs> 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 Or horror films. Well, I find them really restful, bizarre. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah, so I think it's it's almost like having this grab bag of like, if I've got two seconds, it's taking a deep breath. If I've got two minutes, it's a dance. If I've got two hours, then it's watching a horror movie. It's, it's about that sense of kind of um, listening to yourself and what you need. Yeah. I was thinking, actually, so just, something just popped into my head quite random. I can't remember what the advert is. You're not yourself when you're hungry. Um, <laughs> it's, you're not yourself when you're tired. Mm -hmm. I think it's like Snickers or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Rosie, Bernadette. 
Uh, yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know who's doing. Um, mental rest. I, yes, a mental rest. Um, I yeah. I'm, well, I mentioned swimming, which is definitely a very restful activity for me. Also, I think time with my pets. We've got a dog and a cat, and and really sort of engaging with them and playing with them is is just incredibly restful because well animals are just incredible and it's a break from sort of the the stresses and strains of human relationships and human connection because i mean particularly well the cat can be a bit uh you know, <laughs> a bit demanding and a bit yeah. uh you know she can she decides when she wants cuddles but but the dog it, there's sort of unconditional love on tap there really so it's uh whenever you want a, a, an amazing cuddle and just to play with a, a good old toy that you want to throw around for her she will always engage with that so so I, I think that's brilliant I also particularly love podcasts um and and just listening to lots of different podcasts so it, you know including yours Sarah although you. uh, yours isn't one of the ones that sends me to sleep um when I'm having a I think that's a good thing. <laughs> um, Bernadette, I'm going to ask you the same question, but also there's another one. There's another question here that says, I feel guilty for taking time to rest, especially when there's a strong drive to be productive. How do you navigate the guilt? I feel like you, you'll be able to answer this. Thank you. Um, I love... Uh, all the things, the cats and dogs, the horror and the dancing. I'm just going <laughs> to agree with all of those and, <laughs> and the podcast. And um, yeah, so I, I hear the person that said that. I kind of, pers I sort of, I tried to probably not really explain it earlier. I've, I've stopped thinking about things in terms of rest and work or even life and work. And so it's all part of one thing. So it feels a little bit more, more holistic. So for example, I off. I'll thread in breaks throughout the day. I'm doing very long days at the moment. I'm just making sure because of Mrs. Mingle that I take these breaks mm -hmm. and I'll go outside and, um, and, and I'll, I'll walk, I go, there's, I'm near a, a wildlife reserve and also some very beautiful parks and the river. So I walk and actually the reason I don't feel guilty about that is invariably, as everybody said, um, work is going on because work goes on when you're asleep when you're dreaming when you're swimming when you're walking when you're so in a way not not to set out to have a rest in order to continue work but with the knowledge that we're connected we're not disconnected from our imaginations and our and our uh, our thought processes um mm -hmm. we we're, we're always uh being we're always alive and so i that sort of persuaded me and stopped me feeling guilty mm -hmm. I I think because I think guilt shows up so often you know particularly my work with freelancers change makers uh, around mo like money like often it'll be like oh, I don't want to ask I don't want to up my rate because I feel guilty because they're a charity or they don't have enough funding or I don't want to you know th there's just there's guilt in so many places and I think for me I've, I don't know if it's my age or something has happened where I, I've kind of felt a bit resentful that there was this constant feeling of guilt you know as a parent working running my own business what really wanting to grow that and do amazing things and then also at some point see my children and like you know do things with them and I just thought I, in a way it's up to me to to let go of it and I know I don't I don't mean that to it sounds really easy doesn't it when you say it but I kind of just thought oh, I've just like had enough had enough of the guilt around this stuff so actually the guilt isn't working it doesn't make anything any better or or you know it doesn't help so I'm no. just gonna like mm. tell it to go away <laughs> <laughs> yeah and if you think about it there's that saying I'm gonna misquote it but um your, unha your unhappiness will not um, make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. You know, your tiredness will not make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. Your sadness will not make the world a better place. But your happiness and your restfulness and, and your peace, they will, because you mm -hmm. are in the world as a happier, more rested, more mm -hmm. peaceful person. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, 
I'm going to start to draw everything to a close. And I did tell the panel earlier that um, I had a very coachy question, which is about, you know, what they commit to in terms of their rest. But actually, there's a question that we've had, which I think would be an amazing question to end on. Um, so if we can kind of keep it quick, if you could instantly transmit one message about the importance of rest to every person on earth, what would it be and why? Mm. that's a great <laughs> question if you i love it it's a coach if you could instantly transmit one message about the importance of rest to every person on earth what would it be and why who would like to start <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll start go on bernadette um when you were rested um you can re re-engage with the world as the best version of yourself, the most happiest, the most peaceful, the most well-rested, and therefore, uh, by being that rested um, version of yourself, you will, uh, just by virtue of that, make the world a better place. Mm. Amazing. Well and, I mean, perhaps by extension, we also can think about, you know, resting the earth you know resting nature and how we you know are constantly trying to sort of you know do things make things and um you know sort of resting our environment in in some ways and how we don't need to sort of constantly be building buildings and changing the landscape mm -hmm. um and sometimes it's okay if things sort of collapse and decay and maybe they're beautiful too mm -hmm. Uh, because there is so much to be done is precisely why we have to rest because when we're fully resourced when we're rested we are so much more powerful and so much more creative and all the activism that we want to deliver is 10 times better yeah Amazing. That is exactly why I invited all of you onto this podcast, because I you knew you'd be amazing. I would just add that one of the questions I will often ask um, clients is, is to kind of get them to think about when they're 90, 95, 100, sitting on a park bench, and they're looking back at their life, or they're telling the story of their life, you know, what is it you really want to say? And is it a long list of your achievements and your successes and all the things you did? Or is it that you had a happy, content, restful life that also made a difference in some way? Um, so, yeah, to kind of do that forward thinking, looking back. Um, thank you, everybody. A reminder that this podcast will be released in a couple of weeks when I find some time to edit and get it out in the world um, and you can find it wherever you listen to your podcast you can just google or whatever um, do good and do well and click the follow and subscribe button um, you can find me all over the place but I mostly hang out on LinkedIn I'm really loving LinkedIn at the moment um, so come and find me there um, uh, just a reminder that Rosie is uh, hosting the um, Rosie, you say it. Otherwise, I'm going to get it wrong. Oh yes, I'm, I'm hosting the uh, the variety event on Sunday, the 24th of March. You can see it come up on the screen at the Sarah Thorne Theatre in Broadstairs. So uh, yeah, next Sunday afternoon, do check that out. It's the closing event of POW. And yeah, it'll be brilliant. There's lots of fantastic comedy cabaret happening. Um, some good friends of mine, including Liz Bentley and Ada Camp, who is a wonderful character comic, and Charlie George as well. So yeah, lots to come and laugh at and enjoy. So, so please do and enjoy the restful activity of laughter. Yes, thank you. And um and a massive thank you to Lisa for your beautiful BSL interpretation um mm -hmm. being an interpreter today. Um thank you to Powell for organizing a brilliant digital day, a brilliant restival. Um I hope that you have uh, enjoyed yourself. Thank you for sharing your time with us this afternoon. Thank you, Annette Corbett, Bernadette Russell, and Rosie Willby. It's been an absolute pleasure. Look after yourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. That was incredible. Oh, my goodness. I loved it. Oh. Um, all of the stuff in there about 
like contentment and that that is something that we can be striving for in our lives as well as action and change is beautiful so thank you very much um we have got another wonderful thing lined up for you soon obviously it's pal uh but before then i am gonna just remind you again that pal uh if you are able to donate to pal to continue these like wonderful events that happen all year round but particularly around march uh then you can do that on the pal website um and yeah we'll i'll flag that again at the end but it's always worth doing um send the link to your really rich friends as well see if they can do something about it um and before our next event lisa i am going to do read out one of the poems called asleep you become Con a continent so if you would like a moment to find it you're very welcome to you've got it yay wonderful um so this is one of my absolute favorite poems i shouldn't i shouldn't have favorites but I think I do. Uh, and it feels perfect to read today. So this is Asleep You Become a Continent by Francisco Aragon. Asleep you become a continent. Undiscovered, mysterious, long, your legs mountain ranges, encircling valleys, ravines, night slips past your eyelids. Your breath, the swaying of the sea, sprawled across the bread like a dolphin washed ashore. Your mouth is the mouth of a sated volcano. Oh, fragrant timber, how do you burn? You are so near and yet so far. As you doze like a lily at my side, I undo myself and invoke the moon. I'm a dog watching over your sleep. I'm just obsessed with that, the imagery of that and kind of what a celebration of rest depicted as like observing a loved one sleeping. I think it's a really powerful image that I've really enjoyed like rediscovering through this poem. And so I hope that you do too. Um, what we have got coming up now is a real treat um the wonderful babes over at everyday racism uh have done an interview with trisha hersey who is the author of rest in resistance and that book was a real inspiration for the power theme this year so i can't wait to hear everything that she is saying in conversation with the everyday racism women um we are going to dive into that and then I will see you in a, a little bit afterwards to introduce the next thing. So enjoy. Oh. 